It used to be that when the world was at war, it was somewhere over there. Unless you were a soldier fighting for your country's freedom, you really didn't experience it for yourself. Today on Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee, we're studying a violent section of Scripture in the Old Testament book of Zechariah. In his 10th vision, Zechariah pictured the world at war, like history has never experienced before. Dr. McGee said Zechariah is describing an actual world at war that will happen in the end times when the entire earth will be inflamed in violent conflict. We're in Zechariah chapter 6 today, and as the red horseman rides through the earth, Dr. McGee says reverently, all hell will break loose. This time in the Great Tribulation will be frightening and devastating. Well, let's study it together with reverence for the Lord who will someday say enough to evil. But before we do, Greg and I have got some really good news to share with you. It seems it's needed as we travel through this rather rough patch of Scripture, and it's just great as we're going to be praying this week with our world prayer team through Eastern Africa that while we're looking at a pretty ominous section of God's Word, we can really rejoice in what what God is doing in Africa. Yeah, and in these particular countries that we're going to be looking at through the Bible is really the cornerstone of Transworld Radio's broadcast ministry into that country. And there's, as we've mentioned before, not a lot of pastoral training, not a lot of seminaries, and guess who fills that void? And we're so happy to fill it, and we're so grateful that the Lord lets us be that uh, that Bible education for people that couldn't afford to go away yeah. and get it. And, and a country that you hear something about but not a lot is Somalia. And yes. the, the wonderful ministry that's going on with TTB in Somalia, we're one of the only sources of biblical truth in that country. Think about that. The I know. only source. I know. Imagine if you turned on the radio and, and all you had was through the Bible. I mean, that's, that's pretty good, but we're grateful we have so much in this country. But here's a, a letter we got from a young person in Somalia who is listening in the Somali language. I heard your teaching and have become a follower of Jesus. Boy, we never get tired of hearing that, do we, Steve? He goes on, this program builds my faith and every evening I lock myself in my bedroom and benefit from these programs using my headphones so that my parents will not find out what I'm doing. Wow, what an encouragement. So if you have a heart for Somalia, think about this kid in his room, door locked, listening on his headphones to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the teaching five years through the entire word of God. What an opportunity for us to be a part of that. And Steve, he doesn't say it, but it's very likely that uh, his family is Muslim and that he's very worried, not just for his own safety. He might get thrown out of the house. He might get disowned. He might not have any money. So, So this is real life and death. Yeah, here's another listener. This one lives in Burundi. And that, by the way, is one of the smallest African countries. He listens to our Kurundi program. Here it goes. Um, I have been listening to this teaching program with my friends. At first, I didn't like it. I don't know why, but I continued on. But now I am really touched by your messages. I would like to change and follow Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Please pray for me and tell me how. What a layup for a perfect hit. <laughs> it's true. And, and Steve, when I meet people here in the States, they, they all know and love Dr. McGee and his discipleship teaching, what we would call it. What is extraordinary is the way God uses Dr. McGee's teaching in all these other languages yeah. to lead people to faith, because he's always talking about Jesus, and he's always preaching the gospel. Yeah. Really powerful. Now, here's one from uh, Malawi. This uh, young man in Malawi writes, I am always encouraged by through the Bible. One thing I ask you is to help me know Christ as Lord and Savior of my life. Is this possible? (laughs) I think I hear a lot of amens in our listening family. Yes, it is. He says this, I go to church, yes, but I'm not fully transformed into a true believer. I don't know how to change. Please help me. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Just, again, the need for people to be discipled, the need for people to be strengthened in their faith, and through the Bible, fills that void. You could be praying in such an effective way for this part of the world. And again, by joining our TTB family and joining the World Prayer Team, ttb.org forward slash pray. Sign up today. Pray for places like Africa, for Malawi, for Somalia, and really get a a worldview of ministry. I know a lot of people listening to this program already have that because they're supporting missionaries, but you can be praying for this ministry and the impact it's having around the world. Greg, why don't you pray for us? 
Father, thank you that we get this wonderful encouragement from seeing your word transform people's lives all over Africa, not just the countries that we that we read letters from today. Thank you that you're at work in Africa and around the world and that your word is unchained. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come today to this sixth chapter of Zechariah. And before we do, I don't want to let go the last chapter without clarifying something there. I'm of the opinion that there are some that have come to the conclusion that I'm a male chauvinist, that I have been rather harsh upon the female of the species in several of our recent broadcasts. And I haven't really meant to be that way. But we saw last time this woman in a bushel basket flying through the air. She's the first astronaut, and the first astronaut, therefore, was a woman. And she's in this bushel basket, and it's being carried by two women with wings of a stork. And a stork was an unclean bird. That in itself is rather suggestive. And they are taking it down to Shinar, the land of Shinar, to Babylon. And these two women are not the flying nuns either. They represent, in fact, the three women here represent an evil principle. Now, we have said that it represents because the bushel basket and that weight of lead that was there speak of big business. It speaks of commercialism. It speaks of that which is godless. And we said last time that this represented what Israel had learned from the Gentiles in Babylon. They were a pastoral, agricultural people, and they are that when they return to that land today even. But when they leave that land They go into business. They run a store, and they get involved in that. Now, this is a picture of God's judgment upon his people. And this woman in this bushel basket symbolizes that which is out of place religiously and spiritually. And that's true all the way through the Word of God. In Matthew 13, 33, you have the woman that took leaven and hid it in three measures of meal. Well, it's interesting that women have been involved either as the founder or the leaders in most of the cults and isms and schisms today. And then you have the message the Lord Jesus gave to the church in Thyatira that he wanted that woman Jezebel put out because she was permitted to teach. She was out of place, you see. And then in Revelation 17 you have that harlot riding the beast. Now, that harlot does not represent the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is his body, but it represents that organized religion that will be left here on the earth after the church, the true church, is removed, and I think it will go by the name of a church. And that picture is the most frightful one that we have in the Word of God. So that what we have here is a picture. It represents a system, and that system involves commercialism that's godless, big business, that worships the almighty dollar instead of the almighty God. And the almighty dollar is not so almighty today. That's been reduced down to a two-bit piece. It's a little fella today. And I tell you, in this day of inflation, the almighty dollar is not a very big God to worship, and yet men still worship it. Now, all of this represents that godless system. Now, somebody says, but you put in your notes here that this is idolatry. Well, isn't covetousness idolatry? That is the way that it is described today. Paul says that covetousness is idolatry. And the children of Israel, they no longer worship these handmade idols when they got to Babylon, but they transferred that service over to commercialism, to making money and doing business. Now, God's going to remove that from them, for they are to be his priests during the millennium that is coming in the future. 
Now, this is this godless system, and it originated outside of the Garden of Eden. It is a godless thing. It's not racial in any way whatsoever. That is, it's not confined to one race. It's absolutely true of all races. And I want to give you the description of it that Dr. Unger gives in his book on Zechariah. He says the system comprises the whole mass of unregenerate mankind, alienated from God, hostile to Christ, and organized as a system or federation under Satan. In more than 30 important New Testament passages, a full revelation of the satanic world system is presented. Satan is revealed as its directing head. And you'll find that in several passages of Scripture, by the way. John 12, 31, Revelation 2, 13 are a couple of them. And then the system is revealed to be wholly evil as God evaluates it. God calls it absolutely a totally evil thing. I think probably that I ought to pass on to you just one scripture, and there are several on this. Galatians 1, 4. It says, "...who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God our Father." this present evil world, this world system that is wholly evil. Another passage is Colossians 1.13. And it's shown to be limited and temporary because God intends to judge it. It's doomed to destruction at Christ's second advent. And it's characterized by pride and by greed and by war. And I'd like to add another word there, and that's covetousness. And it is perpetually perilous to the child of God. Now, God intends to remove that because he'll remove the people that have not returned to him because though the nation has in a corporate way, yet there are many individuals that haven't. And God intends to take it to Babylon, remove it there. Why? Because You have in Revelation 17 the judgment of religious Babylon. And you have that harlot vision that John was given is, to my judgment, the most frightful vision that we have in the entire Word of God. There's nothing quite as horrible as that. Then in the 18th of Revelation, we have God's judgment of commercial Babylon, big business, if you please. And this is something that has come under the judgment of Almighty God. And so we have here these frightful pictures that are given. And so I trust that you won't blame me for adopting this interpretation because this is something that runs through the Word of God. And so we have here this woman representing actually big business, covetousness, idolatry, and all that is to be removed from God's people because those that are given to it are to be removed themselves, and they are to be judged. What a picture that we have here. Now, this is the judgment of God's chosen people. Now we come today to chapter 6. And when we come to chapter 6, we've come now actually to the last of the visions and we've identified them as ten visions. And I think probably at this point I ought to give each one of them by name again as we have listed them. We had first the riders under the myrtle trees. Then we had four horns. Then the four smiths. And then the man with the measuring line. And then Joshua and Satan. And then the branch and the stone with seven eyes. Then we had seven, the lampstand and two olive trees. Then eight, the flying roll, a scroll. And the ninth, the woman in the ephah. And now we come to the tenth, the four chariots here in chapter 6. Now, some only find eight visions here, but we believe that it's highly consistent to see that we do have ten visions that are given to us. 
Now, this last vision is of four chariots, and I think probably we ought to get it before us here today. I'm reading now verse 1 of chapter 6. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. All right, now, for just a moment or two, let's look at this again, and this has run all the way through. I'm sure by now it's a little monotonous to you, but he says, I turned and lifted up mine eyes. Now, these visions are not dreams. They were given to him at night, but he was not asleep when they were given to him. His eyes were wide open. He saw these things, and a double emphasis is given time and time again, and we have it here. I lifted up mine eyes. That's enough to let you know that he saw it, but he says, and I looked. And when you look, friends, you've got to use your eyes. And behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. Now, let me go to the end of the verse and attempt to identify these two mountains. What are the two mountains? Well, I have looked at several of the commentators in this particular place here, and their interpretation, and I think most of them agree on it, or at least the majority of the outstanding ones, they believe it's Mount Zion and the Mount of Olives. And that would put you down in the Kidron Valley. So that we have here these four chariots, and they are down in the valley. Now, we assume when we see the four chariots that there are horses that are hitched to them, and we're going to find out that there were, and that there were charioteers or drivers of the chariots. And we'll find that that is true also. Now, since there are four chariots here, it seems that it is a reminder of the fact that we have before us here the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, there's another way of interpreting this, of course. There were four great world empires that Daniel saw, and these four empires were judged of God, and they were all Gentile empires, and each one of them has been judged of God. And that part of Daniel's vision has actually been literally fulfilled. And these four chariots could represent that very easily. But John in Revelation, speaking of that which is future, in fact, he opens that period of the great tribulation period by presenting to us the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And there is a very striking correspondence between these four chariots and the horses and the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And very frankly, I'm inclined to go along with the viewpoint that though it could represent these four nations, and I'm not going to fall out with anyone that sees it like that, but that actually what we have here is the great tribulation period. It looks down to the future when God intends to judge the Gentiles. And whether it means these four nations are the great judgment at the end during the great tribulation period, I think that both are involved here. But the important thing is, we saw in the last chapter, chapter 5, in both the flying scroll and the woman in the ephah flying through the air like an astronaut or the flying nun, why we saw that that was judgment upon God's earthly people, the nation Israel. Now, this reveals God's judgment of the Gentiles not only a past judgment as we have in the four nations, but a future judgment that is coming during the great tribulation period. Four judgments that will finally bring to the earth the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of his kingdom here upon the earth. 
Now, that's very important for us to see. Now, again, let me read this verse with that in mind. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between the two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. Now, bronze or brass, actually, bronze was known in the earth at a very early period. Well, may I say to you, bronze goes back almost to the beginning of civilization. It's one of the metals that you find that it was used in the tabernacle. It was used in two of the articles of furniture that were used in the judgment of sin. One was the brazen altar, and the other was the lava of brass. Both of them stood in the outer court and had to do with the judgment of sin and sins in the lives of these people. And so here, I would assume that since these mountains are called now the two mountains, and they are of bronze, what he's saying is that we're speaking of judgment, that judgment is going forth from God, and the four judgments now are mentioned, and we'll not be able to get very far here. We'll want to finish this next time. Now, will you notice we have before us here in verse 2, before the first chariot were red horses, and before the second chariot were black horses, and before the third chariot were white horses, and before the fourth chariot, we have here the New Schofield Reference Bible has daplid and bay horses. Well, the old translation had grizzled. Well, I like the word daplid better, although I don't know what it means. I'm not, oh, I know what the dictionary says, but I'm not quite sure that I'm clear on what kind of horses they are here, other than they were pale horses. That, I think, is quite evident. Now, again, may I say to you, we have the same color horses in the four horsemen of the apocalypse. And I don't think that this is accidental by any means that Zechariah gave this of the chariots, John of the four horsemen, and we're speaking actually about the same thing. Now, the red horse in John's vision represents war. And the second one, black horse, that represents the fact of famine that was coming on the earth. And then the pale horse is the pale horse of death, and that is plague that is coming on the earth. All of these being judgments from Almighty God. Now there is the white horses that are here also. Now the white horse is a horse that a great many like to identify as victory. Well, the white horse is the horse that you find in Revelation. The first white horse is ridden by one, and then immediately after him is the red horse of war. I think the first horseman represents Antichrist, and that he will bring a false peace into the world, because after him there breaks upon the earth actually the red horse of war, and war breaks out. And I don't think we've really seen a world war yet. I think that this earth will be inflamed by the war that will break out in the end times because man is a warlike creature as long as there's sin in his heart. And when that horseman rides through the earth, may I say, and I say it reverently today, all hell will break loose on this earth at that particular time because no one today seems to emphasize how frightful the great tribulation is going to be when it breaks upon this earth, and it will be the riding of that horse. So I think this is something for the encouragement of those people in that day that Zechariah gave it to them, that God would judge the Gentile nations as he'll judge his own, but that there is coming down yonder in the future, and John picks that up, the judgment of God upon the earth when the four horsemen of the apocalypse ride 
forth. Now we'll look at these more in detail next time. Until then, may God richly bless you, my beloved. Well, we don't know when those four horsemen will ride, so we're urgently and faithfully getting the word out while people still have the opportunity to turn to God. If you want to partner with us in prayer as we share the teaching of God's word in over 120 languages around the world, visit ttb.org forward slash pray or call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE for some more information. Dr. McGee believed the greatest pulpits in the world are not in churches. Well, where are they? Well, join us tomorrow for the answer as we continue our study in the prophetic book of Zechariah. Jesus made it all, all to be my own. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.